Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Schofield. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and Greg Bear here for uh, uh, for our afternoon talk. Uh, Greg is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. He's here today to discuss his new book, Halo Primordium, The Forerunner Sega. Halo Primordium continues the story of the enigmatic creators and builders of the halos that began in Halo Cryptum. Greg Bear has won both the Hugo and Nebula Awards for such critically celebrated international bestsellers as Eon and The Forge of God. He's co-founder of Comic-Con in San Diego, but you didn't know that and has been writing since he was nine years old, but you also didn't know that. He's been published in Nature, Newsday, and other journals and newspapers around the world and is regularly asked to speak at universities, conferences, and on TV. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thanks for Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just a few minutes ago, I was getting ready to write volume three, and now it's delayed, so I don't know. The game may have to be put off, too been great fun collaborating with 343 and the Bungie folks and everybody on these things. It's uh, quite a privilege to be asked to set up the origin story for what amounts to one of the most popular franchises around. And uh, I've actually uh, kind of been involved in a lot of these franchises over the years. I think the only one I haven't done is Richie Rich. And that, that's coming next. But uh, back when I was younger, in 83, I published a Star Trek novel called Corona. And uh, then later, in 2002 or somewhere around then, I did a Star Trek, a Star Wars novel covering those territories. Just recently, my son and I, my son doing most of the work, uh, put together a Jurassic Park comic series of five comics. And uh, since he was the world's biggest Jurassic Park fan, I just assigned that to him. My son has also helped me out on the Halo series. So he's my resident expert on all the things that I am a little bit too old to have gotten immediately caught up on. Uh, watching him play the Halo game, I figured, okay, this is classic SF. This is the kind of stuff I was raised on. Doc Smith and Asimov and Heinlein all the way down to uh, the, the, the people that, you know, Larry Niven and so on, Arthur C. Clarke, people who ins influenced me also influenced Halo. So doing this series really is old home week. Uh, but we are 100,000 years ago. And in that time period, there are clues set up in the various games, sometimes very compelling clues. There's even testimonies and, uh, you know, different different things, but we don't really know, when I was given this assignment, we didn't really know what the forerunners looked like, we didn't know what their society was, we don't know what their relationship was to the mysterious precursors who came before, there's always precursors, you know, there's, there's never just an origin story, there's always those who came before, and, and all the setups were classic to me, because it seemed like we really were dealing not just with science fiction mythology, but with Greek mythology with origin stories for human beings and all that sort of thing. And as we're about to take one of our earliest meetings, um, and this we can tell you because the first two books are already out, um, my son, who was uh, c coming to breakfast with uh, uh, the folks and me, uh, the Halo boys, uh, said to me as we were walking in, he says, you know, I think your forerunner needs a human sidekick. And I says, yeah, you're right. And so we proposed it to Frank O'Connor and Kevin Grace, and Frank was a little reluctant at first, but within about five minutes he goes, whoa, whoa, and then I know. And we laid out much of what occurs in book one and part of what occurs in book two. And it really ran with it. My son's suggestion, very coolly, has really helped in shaping the new game. Because it's a collaboration. They're doing the hard work again. I'm just throwing ideas at them, and, you know, and they're throwing ideas back at me and putting down requirements and so on. Um, but it really is. It's what I've seen looks awesome. I don't think you will have found a previous Halo game to be quite like this one. It's as if all of the secrets are going to be slowly unveiled to you. And if you're reading the books, you'll be prepared for them. Now, that said, there's often this dividing line between media franchise fiction and the literary world. And uh, I, I kind of go along with that. You know, uh, authors are supposed to be doing their own thing. But in science fiction, there's often been this collaborative phase where authors will take and jog ideas around with each other. They'll throw this ball back, lob it back in this direction. Classically, in my lifetime, I wrote a book called Eon, which, in which an asteroid, a giant asteroid, comes veering into our solar system, and it turns out it's a spaceship. And uh, I was reading, of course, Rendezvous with Rama back when I was a kid. And that's, you know, so when Arthur C. Clarke read this book, I was a little nervous. And he got back to my, 
my editor in England, and he says, yeah, I read the book. The first 75 pages, I go, well, this is just, this is just Rendezvous with Rama. And then he says, on page 76, my jaw hit the ground, and it didn't get picked up through the rest of the book. That's the way we're supposed to do it. If you're going to be borrowing an idea or a vision or whatever, you do it differently. You try and take and run with it in a different direction. And when the Halo people handed me this, that's what I thought we should do. We should go back and explore the deep science fiction roots, but also the mythological roots, the emotional roots, the family roots. Because anyone who's played enough Halo games really feels that they've been walking around the living room of the Forerunners endlessly. And what were these people like? You know, why did they do this stuff? Why did they fire off those halos? What was the flood? Well, we know what the flood is. It's attacking us now. But how did it come about? And along the way, I've been allowed to actually dabble in the, the, uh, the true uh, treasure chest of the whole series. Now, I don't know quite what the Bungie people think about all of this. I haven't spoken with them directly, uh, except for one meeting we had when uh, Halo Reach was, was released. Um, but I hope they're happy because, boy, it's sure been fun for me. And to go back to, again, all of those people who inspired me, and then to add that modern touch, the sort of military SF adventure touch that we get from people like Scott Card and Orson Scott Card and, and uh, Robert Heinlein and later on people like uh, Joe Haldeman and S.M. Sterling and everything and a little bit of my own stuff out of Eon, which I was remembering recently as I watched Aliens, was published before Aliens. So the Marines in space, I've got you know, a, a Marine drop sequence, but that wasn't before Heinlein, and it wasn't before Joe Haldeman, so who did all of this stuff first? I suspect it was probably Jack Williamson, or somebody we haven't read since the 1930s. Science fiction has such deep roots, the ideas are really hard to pick out. So if I, you know, I'm engaging, as new stories come up, people will come along and say, well, didn't you put that in your book? You know, didn't you have the slate, not, not announced by Hewlett Packard, by the way, didn't you have that in Eon? And I say, well, yeah, but if you look at Forbidden Planet, there's also, you know, this object they're looking at that they plug cards into and so on. And, and if you look at Dune, he's looking at an iPad on Dune. Dune, Desert Planet, that's the app he's got running on his, his Eric Keen iPad. All these things, we really have a hard time finding out who did it first. The, uh, the historical science fiction sequence was blamed on Robert Heinlein, but it actually was a fellow who did it before him, whose name I'm going to forget now, who... Uh, who actually did create the first history sequence in a science fiction series back in the late 1930s. Heinlein picked it up, and, and when John, John W. Campbell was a meddler, he was the editor of Astounding Magazine. And Astounding Magazine was this astonishing influence on engineers, scientists, and everybody all over the world. So story number one. Um, Heinlein goes to Asimov about his robot stories and says, Isaac, do you realize that your robots follow ethical and, and practical guidelines? So here, I've laid them out for you because I found all of these things in your stories, and here they are, the three laws of robotics. And Isaac goes, by George, you're right, and puts them in the book. Isaac wrote it, John Campbell found it, distilled it, and put it there. When Heinlein's sequence came along, Campbell says, Bob, and they didn't always get along, especially later, you know, this, you're, 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 you're having a kind of a historical sequence here. What if we put a timeline together and published it? of the way your stories fit in. And they didn't all quite fit in, so there's off the main sequence, there's the main sequence stories, there's the timeline, which I believe was published in Astounding, but was, was, was also published in book form in um, Man Who Sold the Moon, or one of those books. Okay, so there's Campbell doing that. Now, Campbell is not just affecting science fiction at that point. We're going to veer off into another territory here, away from Halo for a moment. John Campbell is affecting policy. Because he's looking at the different things that are coming out of the scientific press. This is 1939. He's been editor for a couple of years. He's a young man, but he's very ambitious and he's very smart. And he realizes there are engineers all over the world who read his books. And something's happening. There's fission being uh, you know, discovered, being, being efficiently done in Germany. Uh, Frischen and... Uh, uh, Lena Whitemuller, anyway, um, I have done this. And so he's looking at that and he's saying to himself, you know, I wonder, since there's a war coming very soon, what's going to happen during that war? And since I know that engineers all over the world are reading my magazine, I'm going to do a kind of a test here. In November of 1939, he publishes an editorial in the back of Astounding Magazine, which is a bedsheet size at that point, saying, 
I wonder if we can get through this coming war without building and using an atomic weapon. And New York Times is publishing editorials about this possibility too at that point. In the 1940s, I forget exactly when, 42 maybe, uh, he has a, a, a writer uh, publish a story on fission and that story, it turns out, ends up in the analog, in the astounding library at Los Alamos where it's read by people like Richard Feynman and everybody else and they sit around and start discussing this story about fission, uh, a science fiction story, and suddenly you have the FBI agents in the back of the room going, what? What? And taking notes. And someone knocks on John W. Campbell's door a couple of weeks later and Campbell knows. He's had his experiment confirmed. Now he never actually said this, but Gregory Benford asked the scientists who were in the room at Los Alamos, and oh yes, we got our, our astounding subscriptions, and we discussed all the stories. And there was this visit to, to uh, Campbell's office by the FBI, and suddenly Campbell knew that science fiction did get through, and that the people he wrote for the, the editorials he prepared, the stories he edited, were going out to the people who were doing something interesting, enough to attract the attention of the FBI toward him. Got explained, it's just science fiction, it's what we do. You know, H.G. Wells wrote about fiction. You're going to go visit him in, in England? Pushed it off. But the whole confirming cycle of the influence of science fiction and everything is now coming back to us with asteroid mining. How many people read about asteroid mining when you were a kid, along with jetpacks and everything else, right? Flying cars, jetpacks, and asteroid mining. We have the Rolling Stones, Heinlein story, we have the, the uh, Tales of the Flying Mountains by uh, uh, Paul Anderson, my father-in-law. We have uh, Larry Niven's stories of the asteroid miners and, and belt things and belt that and all that sort of stuff. It's so common in science fiction. In the 1990s, just after we moved up to uh, uh, Seattle, I was asking myself, we've got all these rather wealthy people who don't seem terribly interested in space. Not that they're talking about. But, you know, they were raised on Mr. Heinlein. I know some of these guys, and, and they, they, they liked, you know, the movies, and they liked the books. And I wonder if they saw that scene in Destination Moon where this mighty rocket engineer is laying out the plans for sending a nuclear-powered rocket to the moon. Great movie, 1950. George Powell, Robert Heinlein script. And he's invited all these wealthy entrepreneurs to come sit in the room and he shows them this movie of, of what it's like to be in zero gravity, basically get the ropes on, on propulsion and gravity and the moon and all this stuff with Woody Woodpecker doing the introduction. And um, they all sit around and he says, space is the high ground, which is a phrase that I heard throughout the 80s and 90s too. Space is the high ground. And as they say in, in Gettysburg, the high ground. If you don't have it, you're going to lose. And the engineers you know, look down at the, at the uh, entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneurs, mostly elderly, mostly looking like they're between 70 and, and 90 or 100, they all go, okay, let's do it. And they build the rocket, and riots come because people don't want a nuclear rocket to be launched, and they launch it anyway, and it goes to the moon, and all that sort of What a wonderful vision. What a wonderful movie. Because A, it was politically astute. There were protests over the launching of nuclear-powered space probes and so on later, you know, um, and Heinlein kind of felt that coming. Uh, but there's also this thing that very, very wealthy entrepreneurs are going to be the ones who will ultimately haul us off into space. And about the mid-90s, the rumors started to come down that there was interest. And by the mid-2000s, it was obvious, and suddenly everybody was lining up, and there was Blue Origin. And then we had Elon Musk doing his thing and very seriously doing his thing, launching satellites for the Air Force. I saw one that didn't get launched at the Air Force Academy recently. They have their filing cabinet of prototype, test model, satellite. And the engineer looks at me and says, that third one, you're not supposed to see that again. <laughs> it came crashing back down through the roof of the launch center at Kwajalein, apparently. And, and, you know, and, and so they get a free launch on, on, on Elon. In the 1980s, when I was working uh, with Jerry Parnell and Larry Niven and a bunch of other folks, I met a bunch of rocket scientists. One of them was Max Hunter, who was one of the fathers of the Atlas Missile Program. And he looked at another rocket scientist named Gary Hudson, who had just launched and lost a rocket. And he says, Gary, you can't be a rocket scientist until you've launched it, lost at least a dozen. And that's still true today. So the maxim holds true. Science fiction, once again, propels us as the submar submariners say, you know, I follow in the watery footsteps of Jules Verne. 
uh, as the scientists and entrepreneurs look back and say, you know, I think we could do that. And now there seems to be a bit of a gold rush. There's rumors that venture capitalists are kind of pulling away from um, biotech, where you can spend billions and billions of dollars on a drug that doesn't earn that much money, and, and moving over to the much safer area of asteroid mining, which I find <laughs> utterly fabulous. You know, we need to teach venture capitalists caution once again. But also, I like adventurous capital. And this is a terribly interesting area. And having, you know, in, in my own fortuitous way, having dined or hung out with nearly all of the guys involved in this in the last couple of years, um, I think it's doable. I think it's very doable. And they all were inspired and read not just science fiction, but of course, textbooks, everything else. Because reading science fiction kind of, at least for me, pulled me into that. And we've been trying to find a way to get us back into that feeling of the post-war period of the 1950s when I was just a kid, of the 1960s, the 1970s, the 80s. Suddenly, in the 70s and 80s, that impulse kind of fell apart. We lost our confidence. We got dragged into wars. Same thing's happening now. And so government sort of pulls away. The voters start to pull away. Now is the time for the entrepreneurs to step forward. They're going to need help. NASA still is utterly essential to this entire effort, especially the coordinating it. In the late 1990s, uh, um, 1998, I think, the uh, director of NASA, Dan Golden, requested a special meeting with the Citizens Advisory Council in Tarzana. It was our last meeting, I think, at Larry's house in Tarzana. He's moved since. And a bunch of us got together, and we all sat around, and Gary Hudson said to Dan Golden, look, I'll give you free payload on my rocket. Just clear away the regulations. And Golden says, that's what we're here for, to talk about this. What do we need? How do we get FAA clearances for launches? How do we get experimental launches taken care of? How does all of this pass through security? What are the ways we can green light these projects and encourage all of this to go? And that's one of the things he thought was extremely important to do. Some of the issues, I think, began to be resolved before that or after that, but that was an interesting meeting. Uh, and shortly thereafter, of course, we had the beginning uh, of serious uh, adventure uh, capital in space. There had been a lot before that, a lot of different rocket scientists. We were involved in things like DCX, uh, really pretty rockets that just didn't end up getting funded, X-34, all of these things. Amazing technologies, just waiting for someone to push the button and push us forward. Um, we keep saying, either in Halo or in science fiction in general or in TV shows or in movies, we're going to be in space. And we keep kind of wondering, why aren't we in space more? Why aren't we doing all these manned launches? Why aren't we sending real human beings out there, heroes and heroines, to, to take over the spaceways and show us what's what and, and possibly die heroic deaths and crimp funding for the next 30 years? And we have to make our minds up, of course. And making our minds up is a process of talking to people who really, really care enough to spend lots of money and people who really, really want to go out there, and people who really, really want those people to go out there to survive. That's been my major concern about the whole operation, is we don't know enough about space medicine, even now, even after all these decades, to guarantee that people on a two-year trip to, say, Mars, uh, would come back healthy, or if they could come back at all. Uh, we have not really set up long-term, other, other than space station and, and, and bits of Mir, and, uh, earlier uh, uh, with orbiting laboratories, we haven't really done years in space under zero G, months in space under zero G, and people come back pretty weak. And that's not a good thing. So how are we going to solve that? More research, more people willing to go up there and test things out. But for the time being, for these asteroid miners, they don't really need human beings out there, although you know Bruce Willis, I'm sure, would be happy to go. He loves big spiky things flying around through the stars. Um, but a robot probably could, and that's what we're going to see. And more work done by people like you guys, and more work done by other folks, and it's all going to sort of come together in a vast collaboration where our first children out in space are going to be metal. Uh, but we have an enormous amount of affection for some of these metal children, as Donna Shirley will point out. We really do. We like watching them. They become the Wallies of our space program, and we get you know, very attached to them, and we keep supporting them. So when we send our children out there, metal or, or flesh or whatever, uh, we are sending our hearts out there. And it comes out of that emotion that we had when we were kids 
I, for me, it starts reading comic books, reading Heinlein, sitting at the black and white television with the flickering picture of John Glenn going up. For me, it was four in the morning. I got up. I was eight years old. Didn't think there was anything cooler on earth than to get up at four in the morning and watch a rocket ship take off. I remember sitting in front of the television screen, which was color at that point, but watching the black and white picture from the moon as Neil Armstrong sets out. Uh, later on, I met Buzz Aldrin and never met Neil Armstrong, but I met a lot of astronauts, a lot of people who had been to the moon and a lot who had gone up in space on space shuttles. And they really were the right stuff. They really were steely eyed. Some of them were a little, little eccentric, but I would be too if I had been subjected to the radiation of deep space for three weeks or whatever, you know. It's just cool stuff to learn about being human in either doing these things or being part of them or going out there and exploring. The joy of working on a Halo novel is that it's got a lot of kids really interested. What's it like to take off in a rocket? What's it like to, to wear a spacesuit and fall from the sky as a plummeting meteor? What's it like to do this? What's it like to go up against alien beings and then eventually learn what their religion is, what their culture is? to do this and, and eventually even to ally with those who were your former enemies? What's it like to come out of a period of endless wars to rise up again and, and find these magnificent things that point back to time when there were wars even before you, before the human species? What's the origin of the human race? In the Halo book, uh, Halo Primordium I'm, um, and, and Cryptum, I'm putting in recent archaeological discoveries because in Darwin's children, I actually had a uh, 18,000, 20,000 year old uh, fossil related to Homo erectus found in Oregon. That was pretty radical. I had a lot of uh, archaeology folks uh, looking at that. That's, that's, that's pretty neat, but we don't think that's very likely. And then on, in, in Indonesia, near Indonesia, Homo floresiensis is not only possibly Homo erectus, and not only about 18,000 years old, maybe even existed up into relatively modern times, they were this tall. They were hobbits. I would never have said that. No one would have believed me. Reality trumps even my weird speculations. So I put them into Halo Cryptum and Halo Primordium, and they're among the most famous, most popular characters for a lot of the readers because these guys are feisty. Just because you have a small head doesn't mean you think small thoughts. You know, and then we have, you know, the, uh, the more recent Denisovans, uh, more species coming up, some of them through genetic analysis, some just a molar here, a molar there, and by God, what's a science fiction series without a giant ape in it? So we get Gigantopithecus into the story in Halo Primordium. Put it all in there, and it's going to lead a lot of readers to go, wait a minute, is this stuff real? And when they find out it is, our past becomes just about as interesting as our future. So tremendous fun doing all of this, tremendous fun playing in the gardens of other very creative people, and tremendous fun watching them put this game together and going, oh my God, that's awesome. I want to play that game. Uh, especially seeing some of the things that I've helped create, you know, end up big widescreen stuff being explored in three dimensions and so on. That's very cool. So that's what I've been doing lately, and, uh, and watching, and, and uh, uh, watching uh, uh, vicariously and participating in so any questions? Yeah. Um, how do you come upon the titles Darwin's Radio and Darwin's Children? Well, the whole metaphor of uh, the virus being a carrier of genes was what started the notion of Darwin's Radio way back in the 19, probably 1985, earlier. I started asking uh, about, uh, as, I was, as I was finishing blood music in my notebook, I said, what do viruses do for us? Why do we allow them to occupy us? There are some organisms that have such effective immune systems that they really, they just don't have that much in the way of disease, certainly viral diseases, like limulus and sharks and other things. And interestingly enough, no confirmation here, they haven't evolved much. But when you look at bacteria with their phages and you look at us with, as it turned out, I discovered researching Darwin's radio, with human endogenous retroviruses, we are constantly occupied by outside viruses. And sometimes these viruses not only meddle with our genes and move things around, but give us the cap capacity to meddle with our genes. And uh, that's what started this off, is the notion, okay, if you have genes being carried by viruses between individuals uh, in, in uh, the animal species, which we haven't quite confirmed yet, but definitely a possibility, uh, that's a radio signal, Darwin's radio. And it turns out that viruses are FedEx for genes. That's what they do well. Yes, sir. 
Uh, it's great to hear that you're optimistic about the feasibility of the asteroid landing. How do you feel about the feasibility of the space elevator? Ah, oh, boy, there's some materials problems still to be solved there. We've been looking at the monomolecular filament for decades, and we still need that. But also, uh, people like Robert Forward and the, and, and the gentle folks up here who are working on this are also working on, on viable tethers that actually have a weave that can survive micrometeoroid erosion. That's the major thing. If you have the strength, the ductile strength, and, and if you have the ability to resist micrometeoroid erosion, or, or you know, the rarer, larger meteoroid strike, uh, if you have that kind of robustness, then I think these things could be doable. Certainly you can already do things like repowering satellites and so on by dropping tethers down into a magnetic field and sucking up the generator juice. Uh, that's been done. So you know, that is possible. And that can refuel vehicles in orbit. Uh, wherever there's a magnetic field, you can do this sort of thing. So small steps, big steps. Um, all someone has to do here at Microsoft Research is find the monofilament, monomolecular filament, and, and maybe the general products hull next. Are you guys aware of what that is? You've got to read Larry Niven books. If you aren't doing research on the general product, products hull, I've got to get Rick after you. It's a hull that basically is totally inert to all activity. It can even go into a neutron star and come out the other side. What's inside will be crushed and mashed, but the hull itself will survive. It's made by the uh, um, uh, puppeteers in uh, the Ringworld series and so on. Get busy. Yes, sir. Could you talk about the recent decision of your publisher to, to drop DRM? Yeah, I, did. I just heard about that yesterday. Uh, you know, uh, J.K. Rowling did it. What's good for J.K. is good for the rest of the world, I assume. But also, we did it when we were working on uh, Mongoliad. Uh, Neil Stevenson, Mark Teppo, my son, a bunch of other good writers, and myself. And, and it was Neil's decision and Mark's decision that DRM just really wasn't helpful. I don't agree with that in all circumstances. <clears throat> but I do notice that there's a vast trend towards going after the pirates overseas. And... We're following in the wake of the Queen Elizabethan ships of, of Hollywood going out there. But, you know, Queen Elizabeth started up piracy, too. So I don't know where we're going to end up on all of this. Um, DRM is irritating to a lot of people. I know it's irritating to me when I want to reinstall Windows, you know, on another hard drive. There's all these versions of it, and yet the, the losses suffered under these uh, vigorously philosophical pirate programs. You've heard of the religion, haven't you? Kospizmi, Kospizmi, you know, it's my it's my right to copy because God wants it to be so. That's like the Republican right to be fabulously wealthy and Christian because Jesus wants you to be wealthy and keep it all. It's perfectly obvious to me. But it's all going to work itself out one way or the other. What I love about what's come up recently <coughs> is uh, Microsoft's investment and Nook and everything is really putting the screws to the whole environment. I love it. Competition in which writers are suddenly the main focus is great. And as these platforms become more and more versatile and more and more open and more and more available, more and more writers are going to be free to get really unhappy when New York Publishing rejects them and says, you, you just you won't sell anything. Oh, yeah? And go out and do it yourself. And that's happening. I was talking to a good writer who uh, published a book, Stephen Manis, on the... Uh, um, Pacific Northwest Ballet recently, beautiful, big, thick book, self-published because he says, I don't think there's a publisher out there who can sell five times more copies than I can, but they will get all the royalties otherwise. So I'm going to do it myself. Seattle Times wouldn't review his book. Why? It's a self-published book. We don't review self-published books. So the attitudes from the 40s and 50s where Vantage Press was the only thing, you know, if you're self-published to today, where being self-published is probably going to be the rule. I wonder if they'll award a Nobel or a Pulitzer Prize to a self-published book. I don't know. Things got to catch up. Yes, sir. You had a question over here. Yes, yeah, since we're on the subject, um, is there any is there any sort of push to? Um, well, I'll just say it like this: I would really like to be able to purchase like the ebook and a hard copy together yeah. and not pay double the price. Right. And they already do that kind of thing, like with a lot of Blu-rays and stuff. You can get it. And Absolutely, it. fourteen different discs in one thing for four ninety eight. <laughs> well, I meant you know a lot of them today are they come with like a digital copy code right. where you, you buy the Blu-ray and like. Yeah. I think that's per you know uh, Jim Bain used to package uh, CDs of all the previous books in a series for free if you buy the hardcover. That was fairly smart. Uh, most publishers aren't caught up to that yet. But definitely what you need is some way to redeem uh, uh, or buy either a hardcover 
or whatever, and I think that's going to be happening. Yeah, <laughs> package it up. We, we were trying to consider that, um, you know, how would you do that? And there are some problems. So if you can figure out a, a way to get retailers to deal with that at the same time that you deal with returns, which is still the major problem for hardcover books, you could buy a book, you could take the digital copy code, you could get your digital copy, turn the book back. How would you know? Solve that for us. We'll have that problem solved. Yes, sir. So earlier in your talk, you had examples of how sci-fi started getting into policy. And that reminded me of an article that I read about six months ago about the DARPA 100-year starship program. I'm just curious what your thoughts on that are. I thought it was fabulous. Uh, just before that, I had written uh, Hull 03, which was kind of the solution of what I thought we had to do to solve starship difficulties, traveling at very, very rapid speeds between the stars rather than just crawling along at rocket speeds would require huge amounts of reaction mass. So I had to strap my starship, a very large starship, to an Oort cloud moonlet about 100 kilometers across, which made the relationship between mass and delivery and payload more, more believable. Um, that, I think, is of interest to the 100-year starship thing, but we do need to figure out the technologies and the biologies and we've got all of these, you know, mythic things from the past, like generation starships and so on, which Hull 03 is one of those. Um, but Hull 03 goes into a lot of the politics and a lot of the economics of this. These things are enormously expensive to build. We're probably looking at the gross national product of the entire planet for 10 years to build one of these things. Why? Why would you do it? Why would you launch it off there, you know, in copies, one or two copies or three copies? and not know what's going to happen to it. And so in Hull 03, there's a lot of really nasty safety mechanisms on board the ship. You know, what if you find life on the planet that you're heading towards? Get rid of it. It's too expensive not to, you know, that sort of thing. And so it echoes back into what I'm talking about in the Forge of God, which is, is this an ecological competition across the galaxy? If so, we've got to get smarter. We've got to figure out it's not just economic. There's billions and billions of worlds out there uh, it looks pretty good that there's probably tens to hundreds of millions of Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone. And someone wants their porridge. Sorry, did I just make up that? Uh, I'm sure that's been used before. Yes, sir. Um, so there's a question about um, continuity really, mm -hmm. around the, the, the two Halo novels. Um, so most people, when they're reading you know, di like divergent series of lots of novels. They don't worry that much about technical inconsistencies. But I think probably science fiction readers may be m more concerned with like some, some kind of logical. Say it, say it out loud. We're nerds and we're proud. We love so, it. Um, so I was kind of wondering how much effort did you have to put into uh, the research of all of the games, the existing novels to try and do that? And, and, and also, kind of our follow on question is whether when you were writing these two books, did it feel more like a, a kind of a, an archaeological thing that you were essentially pulling the, the clues from all of the other places and stitching them together? Or was it more like you were writing an independent story that you just had to make consistent? Well, Halo fans are very interested in the detail. And they, they believe in the canon and they really want you to get it right and not contradict yourself. And Star Wars fans, a lot of the Star Trek fans, Star Wars fans, nearly all the fans who are really into it, are, are very much the same way. But with the Halo people, they really have an entire division and operation set up to make sure that the fans are not unhappy. And uh, they did take a risk by letting me do so much original new material, fitting it in between what little we knew about the Forerunners. So we touched those points, and I created points, and then got back to them, and they said, oh, well, we can do that with this. And I say, cool, because that means I can do that with this. And then we can run with that, and we can make this character that character. We can identify, and what we're doing is we're taking, like, you know, the secret history of Halo, all the stuff that you know, it's so well-structured, just as an original story, even as thin as it might have been in terms of the origin, that we can now fit in all the rest of this stuff, and then take it off and expand it into this huge game. So while we're doing that, though, and they're doing their creativity, I really have to be flexible enough and write well enough and have meetings often enough, and they have to coordinate with people in the office that we do keep all of this straight. It's been very helpful because <laughs> these are really bright people, and they're really helpful to me, and they're very sweet. And uh, I think I haven't made them angry once, so I hope not to. But we know we're not, we're not putting Richie Rich into the series, so. 
That was my prime objective, and they wouldn't let me do it. On the Star Wars novels, the one thing they wouldn't let me do uh, on uh, uh, my Star Wars novel, although they gave me the chance about to write about Darth Vader as a teenager, they wouldn't let me have Darth Vader come back through the Force and influence Anakin Skywalker and teach him the ways of the dark side. They wouldn't let me do that. Lucas says, no, no, none of that. They also wouldn't let me have Anakin be shriven after his first uh, assassination. No, that's a religious word. You can't do that. A few things we have to follow through on here. I was trained well in, in, in things to understand that when you're writing in a, someone's favorite series, you don't mess with the tropes too much. But when you're allowed to fill them in, that's great fun. One more question? Yes, sir. Now you were talking about things that were dreamed up decades ago that have since become a reality. Is there anything in particular that you've seen dreamed up recently in recent science fiction that you think will be promising in the future? Probably. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not yet in that age, the new age, of, uh, of pioneering everything all over again. So a lot of the stuff that was easy to think about and easy to imagine doing was written about in the 20s and 30s. Television, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, computers, we imagined it, we just didn't get it quite right. Some people came along and made computers available on everybody's desktop. And while I was writing about that in the 70s to some extent, and while Isaac Asimov was one of the few science fiction writers who said that, even up through the 70s, people were saying, oh, it's going to be central computing systems and tyranny forever and ever. Not quite. So technology makes us reverse course and reestimate. And that's great fun. As for what's coming up now, anybody have anything you've read recently that, that you think would... I mean, this is just Halo, you know, in Halo, in the, in the modern era of Halo, you know, they have, they have AIs that they're not just human, like, they, they have capabilities, like, far beyond, you know, humans. And, right. And, like, they, you know, it's not possible for them to even, like, run their ships and all their operations without them. And yeah, that it turns out like the Forerunners were the same way. Could somehow, you know, eventually be the case. I think that's true. In, in that case, you've got your AIs being very collaborative, not to mention charming and half-naked and blue or entirely naked and you just don't care. So I think that all of that is part of the romance of the future is, is this what we're going to be seeing in 500 years? Is, is, is Hal going to be Harriet? You know, or, or uh, we just don't know. Remember, there was Hal. And Hal is kind of an Ansela, or he's a, a, a helper that needs to, be, to run the ship, and things go wrong. So I think that's kind of some of the origins here. But Hal is by far not the first. We have to go back to the golem. And, and find out, you know, about the artificial being that was created through magic and alchemy and, uh, and religious incantations and suddenly rises up to defend the, the ghetto and turns bad, which becomes Frankenstein, which becomes Hal, which becomes things in Halo. We've always got these visions back and forth, but is there anything that, that, that you think that you've read about that is completely doable today? You mentioned uh, planetary mining and the Planetary Resources Corporation out of Bellevue of all places. It looks like it's coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. Good people. Good people. Uh, little things. How about products that you guys... Google just came out with something that I wrote about about eight years ago. Specs. You wear them. They project. They give you Terminator vision. Right? So you haven't got all these red lines about people's clothing sizes flashing across your face. And if someone breathes smoke, it says carcinogen. It tells you really important stuff, you know. Now they're doing that. In my novel, Quantico, the FBI agents are wearing these things, and they're connected to RFIDs, which are on their bodies, and allow them to touch their guns and use them, and no one else can use those guns. And the RFIDs are implanted in Mariposa in a rather, you know, more tyrannical compound in Texas, but it turns out that they are subjected to EMP. And so if you put off a non-nuclear EMP burst, which is totally doable, guys, work on it, bang, suddenly everybody's RFID chip burns their flesh and wants to pop out. So there's all this back and forth on technology. The glasses are definitely doable. The RFID chip's implanted. Just because you want to unlock your house and your car just by walking near them, you can do that with your key fob now. But how do you work around that? How do you, how do you make the individual the sole perpetrator and purveyor of the individual's identity. In other words, thumbprints, eyeballs, all that stuff can be duplicated. We saw that in Minority Report, just carry friends' eyeballs around and you can go anywhere you want. You know? 
I remember when the thumbprints were coming up, they said, well, a dead person cannot be used to open up this laptop with thumbprint identification. Oh, yeah? Sure. Your capacitance you know, uh, 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 analysis center will, will process. Yeah, sure. You could probably use a rubber pad with grease on it and get the same result. So I don't know. Actually, they, they uh, check on the military grade ones, they check your blood flow. To see if there's blood flow behind it. The irises have to move. They vary the amount of light. And check there you go. I like that. That's getting better. That's getting better. I want to see some special effects artists work on this now. You know, Stan Winston, bless him, he's not with us anymore, but he could probably have created a blood flow thumb for your... <laughs> your if he can do a you know, full-size T-Rex, he can do the blood flow. Yes, sir? You mentioned the Mongolia. I'm going to mispronounce it. <laughs> Mongolia. Yeah. Um, could you talk about what your experience was like in that process and what your vision is for those sort of cross-platform, cross-media um, creations in the future? Do you think I, the future I think that the, the whole experiment was quite marvelous. There was a lot of talent involved in putting it together. Neil uh, uh, had this vision of uh, introducing a large audience, larger audience, to Western martial arts and to sword fighting and, and what it was really like. His goal now is to create a game based on this in which you will be basically feeling the effect of carrying a broadsword around with you and using it, and you'll have to learn how to use it to play the game well. Um, that game is called Gallo Glass, and it's going to be up on, I think, Kickstarter pretty soon. Uh, in terms of Mongolia, we got a bunch of people in a room, and it turns out enough of them were writers or wanted to be writers that we started kicking story ideas around. So we'd get together in the morning, we would uh, you know, hit each other the head with broadswords, uh, not sharp ones, mostly, and uh, learn how that felt and learn what it was like to carry these things around and practice Fiori and all the different versions of training, the German, the Italian training. Uh, and then find out, of course, if you have a pike staff, forget swords. If you have a naganata, forget swords. You know, you're a dead man if you're a knight. We found all that stuff and then we would get together in the afternoon and plot this giant historical epic based on the un untold history of uh, Europe and Asia and the interrelations there. And uh, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And finally, at one point, Mark Teppo looks at us and he says, you realize we have half a million words here? We put it out first over the uh, website for the Mongolia ad, which became an iPad app. There were some problems with that, the delay because of iPads, uh, uh, Apple's uh, licensing requirements and so on. It took us a couple of months, but you know, we got a fair number of subscribers and, and then we eventually took it around New York and New York was a little conservative. They didn't want to have it available for subscription and being sold as a book, so they said, oh, we can't do that. So eventually Amazon picked us up and we're being published by 47 North and they're quite happy with it. We're way up there in sales on Kindle and, uh, and uh, as a book and the more the merrier. There's seven authors on this book. That by itself would have killed it in New York, I think. Um, without some, some huge names basically trundling it along. Uh, so that's been an interesting experiment. And now the, uh, the, the book is out, volume one is out, and you know, some bookstores are refusing to carry it. It's range wars out there. We're going to have to find out how to make barbed wire to keep these people separate because they're, right now they're shooting daggers at each other. Uh, uh, ecosystem where you get the main authors and then all the people writing variations on that, uh, which are in, in Japan are just kind of ignored, uh, even when they infringe copyright. And some of those become popular enough that those writers go. go that was our thought. I, I wrote about this a long time ago, back in the 1980s, that franchise fiction would be uh, kind of you'd invite fans in to write your fiction for you. Then you judge it and you put it out and give them royalties if it worked. And that was one of our models, which didn't quite work out. We had a number of people following our fiction and even writing uh, fiction in it, but never got to the stage of where we could pay them. Uh, I think a more stable platform and, a, and you know, more outreach and so on and a different product would be quite possible. But I know J.K. Rowling doesn't want to do this. And a lot of the writers we met have seen their slash fiction based on their characters, and they just don't want to deal with it. You get a lot of that in mind as well, but then the judges there are not the authors, the judges are the right. readers. It's pure democracy, which I think would appeal to Jeff Bezos. I'm not sure if it would appeal to those who have already written their universes and don't want people tromping around in them. One of the, uh, there was many, many piracy debates in, in uh, when we went after some of the books that were being put up on Gutenberg of Paul Anderson's that were not, in fact, public domain. They insisted they were. They kept juggling theories as to why they were in public domain. We finally shot them down. But along the way, we had people writing to say, I want it all to be public domain. I want to write my own alien book. 
I think the aliens need and such and Halo books. I'd like to write those. No, guys, go out there and do your own original stuff. Please, I am not happy to have you out there tromping around in stuff. That's easy. I do it. It's not easy, but you know, you know what I mean. It's easier than creating your own universe and fighting that fight. And that's the, the advice we have to pass out to a lot of these people. Stop writing Slash, get out there and do your own stuff. Now, I wrote Edgar Rice Burroughs fan fiction and Tom Swift fan fiction when I was a teenager, so I've been there. Yes, sir. So you asked us earlier what we have seen that we think could be um, a new revolutionary technology. Let me turn that question around on you. What do you think that we're working on or what could we be working on right now that could realize some of the aspirations you have for better technology or revolutionary technology? Well, at the Air Force Academy recently, I got a brief summary of what's going on in quantum computing. And I'm still a little confused. So you've got to break it all down into a Hamiltonian. Which Hamiltonian? The one that describes the total energy of the system? You know, I can't even find it on Wolfram Alpha. And then there's, you know, it, you're going to be doing Fourier analysis to solve your problems. Sounds like many, many ways of saying it's a very focused thing. We don't know quite how to use it yet, even if we do have it. So what are you looking at? Are you looking at a way of using a, a, a computer that spreads across all known universes and those you don't know? Is that what you're really saying? Or are you saying that, you know, that you're solving problems here uh, using all possible solutions? Are you doing a, you know, a... a, a, a some over histories kind of approach. I just don't know. I'm not smart enough to make sense of it. Help me make sense of it. And then help me use it. I want a chip that does that. But if we're going to have to do, you know, room temperature superconductors brainstorm 1983 or whenever it was, or anything else, um, there's just a lot of stuff that needs to be done there. And I'm sure you're working in a lot of these areas. And, and some of you will tell me, some of it Rick will tell me about and some of it he won't. Uh, biology. My area of feeling now is that you've really got to start cutting away the dross in biological theory. There's still so much confusion in the mainstream um, science magazines. Even when they have great results, they just don't interpret it well. They have to satisfy the old guard that's standing over them with their funding and their you know, academic judgments and everything. And so I'm trying to think of what I read recently that just didn't make any sense. Um, looking for statistical anomaly. Oh, in autism. Uh, we went looking to see if there was this effect and we didn't find it. So there are reasons why we didn't find it. No, you didn't find it because your theory was wrong. Get it together. Stop looking for random variations. Well, you're looking for an effect that might be an epigenetic effect and you're trying to find it in the sequences. Why are you doing that? If it's epigenetic, you're not going to find it by sequencing the genes. You, you know, and, and so take a look at it epigenetically. But the thinking isn't there yet. Uh, we need better theory in the most important aspect of the sciences today. We are still hung over by the Dobshansky and randomness of the 1920s. Steam engine mechanics still dominates biological theory, and it's caused so much harm in terms of, you know, one of my great moments in, in personal history was to be at a, a, a side shoot of a DARPA conference. At 8.30 in the morning, I'm standing up and saying, we need to stop using randomness as an excuse and start looking at the personality of the things. We need to use our, our novelist brain to figure out who these are when they're at home and what they want to do. And instead of sitting there and saying, a oh, mathematical analysis will reveal it to us. So a hand was raised up in one corner. And I says, yes, sir. And he says, oh, you can't. I think you're, you're, you're giving randomness far too little credit. I had about 10, minutes, uh, 10, 10 seconds to discuss this with the individual, and it turned out he was the, the, a Nobel Prize winner who had found the sequences of ribonucleic acids. Great. Here I am, an English major, arguing with a Nobel Prize winner. But I was right. And we need to get that stuff down. There is a lot of work being done now in corporations and elsewhere that basically ignores the, the biological theory of the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. We need to, to find out what works and what doesn't. So that's my last greed on that. I think we need to sign some books. And thank you very much for tolerating my, uh, my lateness and, and the impromptu nature. As you can see, I prepare all my speeches far in advance. <laughs> thank you very much.